Okay, now you are able to distinguish among the three process, a white noise, stationary process, and a non-stationary process, right? Is it clear? Okay. Now one more thing. Consider this case where phi is equal to 1, that is when there is one unit root, when the root is equal to 1, okay, we have this non-stationary process. This also we have a non-stationary process. This non-stationary process is called a random walk. This is the random walk. Random walk. Here we have an alpha, that is a constant is there, intercept. This is called a random walk with drift. random walk with drift. Therefore, this is called a random walk without drift. So, this is a random walk without drift and here we have a random walk with drift. What is that drift? Do you remember the mean? Mean of this process is equal to? This is 0. And the mean of this is equal to alpha into t, alpha t. This alpha t is the drift t because this alpha becomes alpha t, a deterministic trend. This is a deterministic trend. Alpha t is a deterministic trend. Here there is no deterministic trend. That is why we say random walk without drift. So in general, whenever we have phi equals 1, the root is equal to 1, there is a unit root, then the process is a random walk. Okay? It is a random walk. Why it is called a random walk? Why is it called a random walk? Why the stock market movement is assumed to be random walk. Earlier you told it is unpredictable, right? It is unpredictable. The movement of a random walk is unpredictable. And we have, we have a life experience of a random walk, not, not in the stock market. When we go out on the road, we can, buy, we can find random walks. Random work of whom? Drunkard, right? So this process is called random work in analogy with the random work of a drunkard. So drunkard means random work or random work means drunkard. The movement of a drunkard is unpredictable. Suppose he is moving this way, then we think that he will go directly, right? No, then he will turn this way. That is, it will be like this. So he is going this way, instead of continuing that way, he will go down here. Then again this way, this way, this way. And this is the time series plot of a, a random walk without drift. So if you find, if you plot a time series of a variable and if it looks like this, approximately it is non-stationary. Similarly, for the random walk with drift, we will have a plot like this. What is the difference between these two? Yeah, here there is a deterministic trend. At the same time, around the trend, we have the random walk. What is around the trend, there is a random walk. Here the trend is, this particular say, zero. The trend is like this. What is? So we have the random walk 
with drift and without drift. Now, if this is the time series plot of a stationary series, no, non-stationary series, a random walk, how does a stationary series look? Suppose I'm, I'm giving a plot like this. Is this a stationary process? This is a stationary process. This is a stationary process because the mean is zero. And what is this? This distance, what is this distance? Yeah, that distance gives us an indication of the variance. That is the deviation, deviation from the mean, right? It gives the deviation from the mean and that is constant. Got it? So this is a stationary process. Not only because it has a zero mean or constant mean and a constant variance. See, whenever the value or the, va the variable moves away from the mean, it will come back to the mean. When it goes down, it will go back to the mean, right? We have a large number of reversions or what is called mean reversions. Uh, we have a large number of mean reversions. The variable will be reverting to the mean a large number of times. So this mean reversions or a large number of crossings, we have a large number of crossings. So if any time series plots with a large number of crossings or mean reversions, then it is a stationary series, approximately. Okay, this is not, remember this time series plot is not enough. We need some statistical test. So we are now moving to the statistical test. So given an IR1 series, say alpha plus 5y t minus 1 plus ut, where ut is a white noise, if phi is less than 1, is it stationary or non-stationary? Stationary, if phi is equal to 1, it is non-stationary, right? Now, whether a series is stationary or not, we can find out statistically using a method called Korlogram. Okay, that is we have we have statistical tests to find out whether a series is stationary or not. The statistical tests we can have one as classical anti model. The classical method of finding out whether a series is stationary or not is through Korlogram. And the modern method is using unit root test. Unit root test. So these two methods we will learn. Now we will start with the classical method of finding out whether a series is stationary or not. That is Korlogram. Korlogram is a graphical device and it consists of two devices. One is the autocorrelation function. Autocorrelation function. That is SEF. Another is partial SEF. That is PACF. Korlogram, okay? So in Korlogram we have ACF or PACF and PACF, not all. ACF and PACF. Now what are these autocorrelation function and PACF? <laughs> what 
autocorrelation function that is autocorrelation is a function of the lag okay the lag we know that is ut and ut minus k you remember similarly we can have yt and yt minus k now do you remember the how do we get the autocorrelation from which measure we are getting autocorrelation we need correlation how do we get correlation we are getting from covariance standardized covariance is correlation similarly standardized auto covariance is auto correlation so we have to find out the auto covariance now remember if we have two variables x and y correlation coefficient between rx y is given as covariance of x y divided by standard deviation of x into standard deviation of y similarly auto correlation also we can write like this say auto correlation between rho we are considering yt okay our variable is yt yt and yt minus k so we can have rho of yt and yt minus k right and this simply we can write as rho k that is only the lag got it we are representing this in like r x y we are representing the auto correlation between y t and y t minus k as rho k depending upon the lag k now remembering this how do we get this this is between covariance of can you tell me covariance of ah y t and y t minus k right divided by yeah now how do we get the standard deviation so this is equal to covariance of x y divided by square root of variance of x into variance of y right square root of variance of x is standard deviation square root of variance of y is standard deviation of y got it is it clear then how do we write this one here covariance of yt and yt minus k divided by root of come on come on variance of ah variance of yt and variance of y t minus k right now suppose variance is the same over all the lag yt and yt minus k all the lag variance is the same in that case variance of yt is equal to variance of yt minus k right that is assume the homoscedasticity assumption if the variance is the same then this variance will be equal to this variance what is in that case what we will get variance yt into variance yt is variance of yt square if we take the square root what we will we will get variance of yt so we can write covariance of yt yt minus k divided by variance of yt got it is it clear so the or just to remember that the covariance or the auto correlation coefficient we can write in terms of this instead of the now suppose this standard deviation of x is equal to standard deviation of y then we are getting standard deviation square right square take the square root of that and the standard deviation square is nothing but variance got it that is what we are getting here is it clear now if you go back do you remember the for the yt is equal to say alpha plus phi yt minus k plus ut if phi is less than 1 we have a stationary series do you remember the variance and covariance of yt and covariance of yt 
whether we have an alpha or not, variance of yt and covariance of yt and yt minus k, yt minus k are the same that we have already found. Do you remember variance of yt? Variance of yt is equal to sigma u square divided by 1 minus phi square, right? We have written earlier, do you remember that? If you just turn, up, turn your page, you can find that. Similarly, covariance of y t, y t minus y, t minus k, do you remember? It is phi power k, then sigma u square by 1 minus phi square. Got it? Now, covariance of y t, y t minus k is given by this. Variance of y t is given by this then what will be our correlation coefficient rho k? Can you tell me rho k will be equal to this divided by this, right? Got it? So this divided by this, what we will get? This will cancel, this also will cancel, we get 5 power k, that is 5 power k. And what is k? k is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. That is autocorrelation coefficient is a function of the lag k. This is the autocorrelation function, ACF. For the first order autocorrelation. Phi power k. So if k equals 0, what do we get? k equals 0, then rho 0 is equal to 5 power 0, what, what do we get? That is equal to 1. If k equals 1, what do we get? Rho 1 is equal to 5. k equals 2, rho 2 is equal to 5 square. Right? And so on. For every lag, we will get a co auto autocorrelation. And that is why this is called the autocorrelation function. Function of the lag. Got it? Now remember, we are dealing with a stationary process where phi is less than 1. Right? Phi is less than 1. If this phi is less than 1, can you tell me what is happening to this rho k as, as k changes values? Suppose phi is equal to, phi is equal to say 1 by 2. Then when k is equal to 0, rho 0 is equal to 1. When k equals 1, rho 1 will be equal to 1 by 2. When k equals 2, rho 2 is equal to 1 by 4. When k equals 3, rho 3 will be equal to, can you tell me? 1 by 1 by 8. Next, what will be the value? 1 by 16. Then, 1 by 32. What is happening to the autocorrelation coefficients? As k increases, the autocorrelation coefficients decreases, coming to 0. We say we have a fast decaying, fast decaying ACF because the ACF is coming down, coming to zero very fast. So, in the coronogram, if the ACF is fast decaying, we can say that the variable is a stationary series. Got it? Now, how do we find the, this fast decay? We have statistically proved it. Okay? That means we have to do a statistical test on the autocorrelation. Now, is this clear that the phi values or okay values, phi power k is decaying, that is it is declining over the lags. As k increases, 
the value will be decreasing fast. Is, it, is that clear? Or do you want some more values? You can put the values and you can, you can also uh, watch. You, you can have a graph of that. You can find that the values are declining very fast. This is for the stationary process. For, so for a stationary process, in the correlogram, ACF is fast declining. Got it? Now, what about a non-stationary process? In non-stationary process, phi is equal to 1, right? Phi is equal to 1. So, the rho k is equal to phi power k where phi is equal to 1. So, we are getting rho k is equal to 1 power k. Now, can you tell me when k is equal to 0, rho 0 is equal to 1. When k is equal to 1, next to what we will get? Rho 1 will be equal to? Or as k, whatever be the value of k, the autocorrelation coefficient will be always equal to 1. There is no decay. Autocorrelation function theoretically will not decay. It will be theoretically always equal to 1. So, if the autocorrelation function shows no decay at all, theoretically, then that process is non-stationary by correlogram. Is it clear? For stationary process, we have fast decay in ACF. For a non-stationary process, there is no decay. But since we are considering sample values, with the sample values, when we apply this when we apply this formula for calculating the sample autocorrelation coefficients, there will be a small decay. But that small decay is not fast decay. So, we have to have a little modification for our definition. If there is fast decay in the ACF, it is a stationary process. If there is no fast decay, then it is non-stationary process. But theoretically, it will be always equal to 1. But in the sample autocorrelation coefficients, there will be a small change, a small decay will be there. Because the covariance of yt, yt minus k, as k increases, this will decrease. This will decrease over the lag. And that is why there will be a small decay. Otherwise, there is no problem. Got it? Now, how, how can we say the fast decay or slow decay? For that purpose, we need a statistical test. Ah, any, any doubt? Come on. I told you about our autocorrelation by t equals alpha plus phi y t minus 1 plus u t, okay. This phi is the root and uh, we are considering in time series econometrics, we are considering only two cases that is phi can be less than 1 or phi is equal to 1. Phi greater than 1 means if we have phi less than 1, we have a converging system. In the, in the system, there will be convergence, okay. In this case, there is no convergence, no divergence. Here we will have a divergence. That is, this system is called a explosive. And in a macroeconomic situation, system, we do not consider any explosive situations. Therefore, this case we do not consider in time series econometrics. 
we consider only the other two. That is unit roots and the less than unit roots. Some other question or related to this? What do we do with the exponential growth? Exponential growth is different from this explosiveness. Exponential growth, see for example, we have for the GDP, when we plot the actual G GDP, it will be something like this. So this is an ex exponential growth rate, growth, okay? That exponential growth is different from this explosive situation. What is? This, this, simply, this simply means that there is an exponential trend, deterministic trend, and also the variable may be non-stationary. That's all. Non-stationary means phi equals 1, not greater than 1. Good idea. So in this case, we have an exponential trend, as well as that is the deterministic trend, as well as another trend because of this phi equals 1. This phi equals 1 is called the stochastic trend. So for a non-stationary series, we have two types of trends. That is, for example, in this case, we have, see, as I told you earlier, say this one. There is a deterministic trend like this, as well as a stochastic trend because of the unit root. So for every non-stationary series, we have two trends, deterministic and stochastic. And here we have a linear trend, but at the same time we can have a situation otherwise. That is the, that, that is, it may be like this. So here we have an exponential trend. So here a linear trend and here we have an exponential trend, that's all. Stochastic trend is the non-stationarity case. That is, when there is a unit root, that situation is called a stochastic trend. Deterministic trend is like, as I told you earlier, alpha t or beta t. That is deterministic trend. That is this this particular trend. This particular trend we can determine. It, which one? Yeah, it can be determined. Stochastic de stochastic trends cannot be determined. Yeah, because it is unpredictable. It is equal. It is the result of a unit root. It is the result of random walk. So we cannot determine that. This alpha t or beta t, that is like this. See, this exponential trend is like alpha t square, okay? Exponential trend is alpha t square. Alpha t square can be taken as an exponential trend. But al beta t or alpha t is a linear trend. So either we can have a linear trend or an exponential trend. But remember, that is different from the stochastic trend. And the case of this explosive situation, we do not consider in time series econometrics or in econometrics in general. Uh, but in, uh, as I told you, behind all this is the mathematical branch of differential equations or difference equations. In difference equations, we consider all these three situations. That is less than one, equal to one, and greater than one. All these three situations we consider. But in econometrics, we do not consider the last one. Because there is no macroeconomic variable that will conform to the explosive situation. Greater than one. Okay? So any other doubt? Any other doubt? Anybody? Anybody else? Ah, louder, louder. Let them hear. 
I will come to that later on, okay? Just wait. <laughs> because uh, this is only the beginning, right? I will come to that. Any other, any other question? Any other doubt so far? Nothing? Okay, so we are tending to the statistical test of autocorrelation function, ACF. The test was given by Bartlett in 1948, okay? Bartlett, 1948. That is, we can test whether the rho k, our null hypothesis is rho k equals 0. The autocorrelation coefficient is 0, each autocorrelation coefficient, k equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, for the different labs whether each autocorrelation coefficient is zero or not. That is what we are testing. And for testing this, all the autocorrelations together, we have a confidence interval test. So this is given by Barnett in 1948. We have 95% confidence interval. 95% confidence interval. Now we are using the standard normal test, that is the Z test. Now what is the Z value, that is the standard normal variate value or the critical value at the 5 percent significance level. You know the confidence interval and the significance level everything, right? We have a significance level denoted by alpha, that is 5 percent. Significance level alpha equals 5 percent. Corresponding to this 5 percent significance level, we have 95 percent confidence level. Okay, confidence level. From the confidence level, we can find out the confidence interval. Now, my question is, at 5 percent significance level, what is the critical value for the t-test or the is a test for a large sample? Everybody knows 1.96, okay, 1.96. So we are using along with this 1.96 in the 95 percent confidence interval. So the 95 percent confidence interval is given as 1.96 divided by root capital T, where capital T is the sample size, okay. And uh, this confidence interval is plus or minus. If capital T, if suppose our sample has a uh, size of 100 observations, 100 observations, then root T, how much we will get? Plus or minus 1.96 divided by root T is 10. Therefore, the confidence interval will be 0 0.196 plus or minus 0 0.196, right? Would it? Now with uh, this value, suppose for all the autocorrelation coefficients, we will have, say this is our plus 0 0.196 and uh, this is minus 0 0.196. So these two will give us the confidence interval. So this is the ACF correlation. Orlogram for ACF. Then here we have the lag, this is the k, this is 0. So this will be equal to say 1, okay, somewhere here we have 1. Now if all the auto, for here we have different lag, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, different lag we will have. Now remember this, if all the autocorrelation coefficients along these lags, lie between the two confidence interval, then that process is a white noise. Got it? That is if, for example, suppose at lag 1 we have an autocorrelation coefficient given by this length and it is between the 95 percent confidence interval. That means this 
auto correlation coefficient is statistically zero. If the auto correlation coefficient is statistically zero, what process is that? Auto correlation coefficient is zero. White noise. You remember? What are the characteristics of white noise? Zero mean constant variance, zero auto correlation, right? Zero auto correlation. So if all the auto correlations are between the 95 percent confidence interval, that process is a white noise. Is it clear? Okay, right. That means we say that all these are insignificant auto correlations. They are simil they are equal statistically equal to zero. Now, if any auto correlation coefficient goes beyond the auto correlation coefficient, or uh, beyond the 95 percent confidence interval, we say that we have a significant spike in this case. Significant spike. In that case, in this case, the auto correlation coefficient is not equal to 0. So, can we say this is a white noise? Is it a white noise? No. For a white noise, all the auto correlation coefficients are 0. That means all the auto correlation coefficients must be between the 95 percent confidence interval. Here it shoots out. So, we have a significant spike. Now, suppose we have significant spike like this, then all this like this. So, the at, at lag 1, we have this autocorrelation coefficient, lag 2, that is less than that, lag 3, less than that. What about this one? Is it equal to 0 or not? It is equal to 0. That is, we have three significant spikes, right? If only we have three significant spikes, or 4 or 5 or 6, then we can say that we have a fast decay. We say that we have fast decay. That is, by the fourth lag, the autocorrelation coefficient becomes 0. Therefore, we have a fast decay. If we have a fast decay, what does it mean? Yeah, if the earlier we have seen 5 power k, you remember, it is, if it is fast decaying, then we have a stationary process. So, if the ACF shows fast decay like this, then we have a stationary process. Is it clear? Ah, anybody? Any doubt? No. Okay. Now, what about a non-stationary series? We have seen that for a non-stationary series, the autocorrelation coefficients are theoretically equal to 1, right? They are all equal to 1, that is in like this. That is considering even by the ninth lag, the autocorrelation coefficient is not becoming 0, right? It is not becoming 0. Actually, there will be a small decay like this, okay? There will be a small decay like this because we are using the sample values. This is what I say. Ma, uh, slow decay. If we have a slow decay like this, then we can say that the autocorrelation coefficient is, oh no, if the autocorrelation coefficient shows slow decay, the variable is non-stationary. Is it clear? So, for a white noise process, how do we find out a white noise process? All the autocorrelation coefficients are within the 95 percent confidence interval, right? Then for a stationary process, we will have fast decay. 
for a non stationary process we will have a decay like this very slow decay even after 10 or 15 lag it will not come to zero okay that is the non stationary case is it clear or you have some afternoon lag <laughs> Or shall I show this using the Gretil? We have Gretil in the packet here, in the laptop. Then I shall show you this one. Or I will show you the, so I will take up certain variables and show you the ACF, how we find out ACF in Gretil. Gretil, are you familiar with the Gretil? Have you heard of Gretil? Gretil is a free software, okay, it is a free software and we can have cross section regressions, all types of cross section, time series and panel data using Gretil. It is a free software and it is the most user friendly software that is menu driven. We just click, 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 we get the result. Unlike R, R is not a menu driven one you have to type the commands you have to download all the all the packages here nothing just click 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 and you will get all the results not only that most of the gretil results are very easy to find out where it is available that we can easily find out but that is not the case with the other packages especially the eviews and other things eviews will give a lot of confusions we do not, we have to be thorough with the, the package, then only we can do that. But that is not the case with the Gretil. Can we do that? Now, do you have time? Yes, <laughs> oh yes, it is your choice. We do not, we, we won't take more than 10 or 15 minutes. It is up to you anyway. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, then, yeah, oh yes, let them, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Then, okay, tomorrow morning we will meet. Anybody, any, any clarification required? Actually, you are not asking any questions, especially afternoon. That's why I asked you about the afternoon lab. Oh, that's very good. You understood everything, right? <laughs> That's that's very nice, very nice of you. <laughs> some some doubts or some comments, something. Ah. Ah. One. No, I told you that there is a small decay. Okay, like this. The first, the second one will be less than the first one. Third one will be less than the second one. It will go like that. It is because of that formula, the sample formula. We have covariance of yt and yt minus k. As we increase k, the sum will decrease. So, yeah, the sum will decrease. So, we will have a, a small decay. But actually, theoretically, there should not be the decay. It will be always equal to 1. Anything else? So, yeah, tonight you think about it and tomorrow you come with a lot of, lot of questions, okay, lot of questions. Okay, then. So, you can download Gretil, okay. You go to the, you have already Gretil, eh? No. You go to the Gretil website. Gretil will not take more than 2-3 minutes for downloading and uh, install.
then uh, I have given some data set, you have got it. So uh, we will do the, we will do it here with, uh, with those data. Okay then, if you don't have any question.